evening, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I'll just pull up the PowerPoint here. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. So we'll look at our <clears throat> active cases. Um, we're seeing a pretty significant increase in our cases. Um, all over um, in Clay County, as you can see, we have 1,271 active cases. So we jumped up from last week um, about 534 cases. So that's a pretty significant increase. Also across Minnesota, um, over a 20,000 increase. We're seeing 67,405 as of the 14th. Um, <clears throat> in uh, Cass County, there's also been an increase. We have 2,034 this week, so it's an increase of 862 from last week. Um, and then across North Dakota, it's 6,955, so it's over a 3,000 increase. So we're, we're certainly seeing the, the uh, increase um, in active cases with the Omicron uh, variant circulating pretty wide and far. Um, the Clay County active cases by age. So you can see an increase across all the ages, but the group that's the largest is the 20 to 24. And then we're seeing, of course, a, uh, an in, uh, largest increase in the 35 to 39, second largest increase. So, uh, but certainly increases across the age spectrum. Our Clay County cases per week, and we, this, the beginning of this is from August of 21. So substantial increases that we're seeing um, during the week of January 2nd. Um, and then the preliminary number on the 9th is the 569. And that's um, preliminary because we need to have the cases catch up to the data. So we'll see more of a delay in the coming days because the testing sites are really strained. Um, due to the large number of um, the volume of cases and testing and staffing issues at the testing site. So uh, we're really going to see kind of a delay in that. <clears throat> Kathy, I want to talk a little bit about the testing site, but I'll wait until the end of the okay. report. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and then these are the trends. So at the beginning from March of 2020, and to date, and so showing at the beginning of the pandemic and the, and the epi curves throughout the pandemic, um, case numbers um, nearly tripling, as you can see, um, January 2nd, the highest we've seen throughout the whole pandemic. Um, here's our cumulative cases by age, total cases 14,979 since March of 2020. Um, and these are the cumulative um, ages. Um, so again, the 20 to 24 at the top, the 30 to 34 um, next for cumulative cases. And then I'll turn it over to Becky. Good morning. Um, so this is the updated CDC graph of community transmission. I think it goes without saying that we remain at um, a high level of, of transmission. Um, all, Clay County, all of Minnesota, and really pretty much the entire nation is at this, this high level. This is our total deaths due to COVID per week for Clay County. We haven't had any new deaths uh, reported over this past week, so our total death stands at 114. And then Clay County hospital admissions due to COVID per week. Um, for last week, we had four reported um, admissions so far. Again, that number will increase as the data catches up. The week before that, we had 11 admissions, which still is at a, a pretty increased um, number compared to what we've seen before. And then this is the hospital capacity information for our local health care systems. So at the time of this report, there were a total of seven staffed adult ICU beds available in Fargo and two pediatric units available, or excuse me, pediatric ICU beds available. Statewide in North Dakota, a total of 20 available staffed ICU beds, and then the only two pediatric ICU beds, again, were in Fargo. Thank you. Doubling back on a question that I had from last week in regards to field hospital needs, are there any discussions with the providers locally 
to set up something like that? Or are we still feeling like we have a handle on the current needs? You know, the, they have it in their plan. Um, if they ever need a field um, hospital, um, they, they don't have to um, activate that at this time, but it's, it's been in their plan. If there's a, a big surge and they're overwhelmed, um, they have plans for a field operation, but um, the details we can't um, get at this time. And this is North Dakota hospitalization data. So these are patients that are hospitalized due to COVID currently. So a total of 139 are hospitalized with 20 in the ICU. Pediatric admissions are at four patients currently, or as of yesterday. Um, and then the graph on the right shows cumulative admissions broken down by age throughout the pandemic. This is the updated graphic from the Sanford Healthcare System as of January 11th. Um, we continue to see that same trend week after week where the, the patients that are most um, severely ill um, remain um, or are among the, the people that are not vaccinated. So 39 of the 44 that are on ventilators are not vaccinated. Question? Commissioner Campbell. Yeah, Becky, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, as a person who had COVID before vaccines were available, and then having had both vaccines and a booster, um, I'm using that as kind of a backdrop here, but first, so we have these different variants, and those variants are happening because they mutate. Is that correct? Am I, am I understanding that correct? Yes. So, and prior to Omicron, Delta was the thing, and now Delta's gone, or it's, it appears to be gone. We are still seeing some Delta <clears throat> cases. I don't think we've gotten a clear picture of exactly percentage-wise. We do know that Omicron is more prevalent than Delta, but we are still seeing Okay, because I was wondering where, whatever happened to Delta. It just... yeah. It's still circulating, just not as much as, uh, as okay. Omicron. And so then my question goes to if a person who has been in my situation where I've had COVID and plus I've had um, the vaccines and the booster. Uh, we know that people can get it again. Um, can it mutate in me right now? So usually when we talk about mutations of the virus as a whole, it's kind of more at the population level versus an individual person. Let's just start something. So, right, correct. And every time the virus replicates, there's a, a chance for it to mutate. Um, but it, it happens in more than just one person. It's, it's replicating, replicating throughout a community at a time. Okay. Which is, it's very difficult to explain <laughs> viral genetics. But I, you know, for, for there to be a predominant strain that would circulate, it would need to, to have mutated in enough people over time. Um, it's not a, a one person kind of a thing, okay. if that makes sense. Um, kind of. Kind of. Okay. <laughs> I, because I was under the impression that um, it, it has to it has to be able to live inside of a person to mutate. Correct. So even if it mutated in you know in you, let's say, mm -hmm. um, it would have to be passed. You would have to pass it to another person for that lineage of that virus to continue on, for that variant to actually take hold in the so community. My, I guess my question goes back to: Can it mutate in me? It probably could start. Yeah, I guess that even can't even though I'm vaccinated. Directly. I mean, I, I don't think you could ever, um, you know, originate a variant back to one one individual. Okay. It has to replicate and make mistakes and mutate several, several times and pass throughout a community before we have a variant that would take hold. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I don't know. Oh, no, I, way I'm, to I'm that. Just, I'm, this <laughs> whole thing is a great big puzzle to me that yeah, I just try to keep <laughs> getting answers to. So thank you. Um, and then the vaccine breakthrough reports. I just I left this slide on here, but the state health department did not update it yesterday because of the holiday. Um, so I will update this later today. MDH will post the updated numbers after 11. Um, so I'll update that, and then the um, report that is uh, posted to our website will have that updated information. Becky, can I ask a question in regards to the breakthrough cases? I think a point of clarification: the breakthrough cases. This percentage is vaccine breakthrough. Are we available to access data 
to get folks that are getting reinfected. So people that may have had the 2020 COVID, what percentage of those folks are getting COVID? So the state health department does have a number of um, reinfections that they report. Mm -hmm. um, again, there's a huge, you know, data data log or lag with that. Um, so that is something that I could provide if, if that yeah. would be of interest. Well, and I think it's important for the public to understand too. Um, trying to obviously do our best to mitigate uh, what we're seeing circulating, but also I think it's fair, probably objective, to say that. Omicron is a different variant um, with different tendencies than the variant that we dealt with in October of 2020. Um, certainly has its own idiosyncrasies, but trying to understand what a reinfection um, percentage would look like, what vaccine, I th just think it's all part of the, the broader picture um, since we do have somewhere around 13,000 Clay County residents that have had COVID in some form or fashion. Right. Yep, I can definitely include those. I know North Dakota also reports reinfections too. Thank you. Can I, can yep, I, Commissioner can I, Campbell. Uh, thank you. I, just going back to the breakthrough cases again. So, so the breakthrough cases are people who have been vaccinated, basically they still got COVID, right? Correct. So even though they've been vaccinated. Yes. Yep. But that 4.85% is still below the, when they, when they talked about when Pfizer first came out and Moderna, they had an effect, effective rate of 90 to 92%. That means that there were, they had already always anticipated maybe 8 to 10% of the population and not working on them. Right. Right. right? Yep, and then one thing to consider too when we talk about um, <clears throat> efficacy of a vaccine is, you know, the breakthrough, do we look at breakthrough infections or are we looking at severe disease? So there's plenty of people that might test positive for COVID, but they're asymptomatic. So, you know, to me, but that's a win for the That's vaccine. with or without vaccine. Correct, yes, yes. But, and again, I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to emphasize that it appears the vaccine are even more effective than what originally was put out. When, when, you, when you compare the numbers, the, the breakthrough cases, I could, also say, I could also say that in my mind, those weren't breakthrough cases, they just, weren't, they just didn't work. Right. Right? It's right. the same thing. And that's exactly, to me, it's exactly what um, the information came out by the CDC and the FDA a long time ago about how effective vaccines are. And, and so to me, even at this late stage in this game and this thing going on now for over a year since vaccines have been available, our, our success rate of vaccines is even higher. Right. In those that have been vaccinated, the breakthrough cases. Yeah. And I would anticipate the breakthrough percentage to continue to increase in light of Omicron, but really mm -hmm. it's the, you know, the breakthrough hospitalizations and deaths that we're that we're looking at, um, you know, if those remain low, which we- I see this as data to encourage vaccines. Absolutely, yes, yes. Not, not a negative, but a positive. Oh yes, the, the, yep, the vaccines are doing their job and very, very well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other? Uh, Commissioner Cayley. I'm just wondering if this spike that we're seeing now is still considered a part of the fourth wave or is this did the fourth wave ever end? Is this a fifth wave? Where, where are we at there? Yeah, that's kind of a million dollar question. Um, you know, if we look at the epi curve throughout the, throughout the pandemic, um, it looks like we may have reached somewhat of a peak um, the end of October with the fourth wave, the Delta wave. Um, cases came down a little bit, but they certainly didn't plummet. So it's kind of a continuation on of, of the fourth wave, I think. <laughs> Uh, hopefully we don't add another spike onto this at the end. Is there, um, I've heard some mutterings about some new variants maybe that are popping up internationally. Is there any information about that yet? I have not heard anything specific about that. I think we can anticipate variants to continue to circulate. Um, you know, and we have a pretty good monitoring system worldwide for that. So they, they break down variants as, you know, variants of concern and, you know, things that we need to keep an eye out on. So at this point in time, there is not a new variant that's a, of, concern. of concern. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. And 
and Jamie will talk about the vaccine data. Okay, well, <clears throat> we'll look at the statewide vaccine data as of uh, January 12th for all those age five and over. And um, we didn't see a lot of movement this last week, so we are at 68.3% uh, 60 uh, of the population that has completed the series, and we were at 68 last uh, week. But um, we also have 68% um, of the Minnesota residents, five and over, that are fully vaccinated. And also we have um, almost um, 1.9 million who've had their booster dose, so that's the strong point. And I would, I would like to also add that um, I agree that the best thing we can do is continue to vaccinate. And, you know, whenever there's a virus, basically um, our, our epidemiologists are looking at a novel or new virus because that's what poses the most threat. And so from the beginning of COVID, we've had, there were several viruses. In fact, I think we had about 10 that um, before the Delta got um, a, attention. But basically they're looking at those that are the largest risk but there also is a connection to that original virus, which helps us with our protection. I'm looking at Becky to confirm what I'm <laughs> saying, but, but that is really what provides us with the best protection. And just like during flu season, we have many flu viruses that are out there. So they take those that are, seem to be the, the most, you know, they're seeing the most of and put that into our flu shot. And there's usually about three in there. And so they're doing their best. But the catch is, you know, that we've had some exposure to it. Either we've had some exposure, we've had our vaccine, and that's why we're seeing good protection. So we really, really need people to be vaccinated because that's the best way we can protect ourselves. Um, it's hard to get, you know, we get distracted by the number of people that are getting ill, and we hear a lot of that about the cases. But as Becky, you know, pointed out, really we're looking at very low hospitalization rates for those that are vaccinated. So that's the key. I think that's not unlike you talk about um, choosing what strains to create the flu yes. um, mm -hmm. vaccine out exactly. of. Uh, I've recall several times that what they choose, and, you know, I think they created in the summer, and it makes sense for for early winter illnesses, but sometimes in the spring we're seeing mutations of even the flu virus to where the vaccine is not as um, not as uh, great at protecting against some of those those strains. So I think that's similar to what we're seeing here. And for those of us that aren't epidemiologists, try to piece together, like Commissioner <laughs> Campbell uh, alluded to, piece together our best understanding as we can. Um, I, my question is in terms of Clay County percentages, do we have a Clay County vaccine percentage? So a little over 59% of the population five and over are fully vaccinated in Clay County. Okay. All right. 59%? 59, 59, a little over 59%. Completely vaccinated? Fully vaccinated. Okay. And then, you know, I know- But that- no, And that's five and I over. Can't, I can't, Commissioner. Um, so, so that's only the ones we know of. Correct. Yes, exactly. But it's at least 59%. Yes. Correct. It could be higher. And, and I will say that we did hear from Minnesota Department of Health that they'd reached out to North Dakota again for another push to get vaccine across the border. So, I mean, hopefully that is a, a little bit more accurate than what it has been. But again, that 59% is of the five and over that are eligible for the vaccine. And so if that's completely over, have... Um, I'm trying to remember back those 12 and you know five through 12 has there been a month to where they could be fully vaccinated i think we're still at the beginning of allowing those so in in terms of 12 and over mm -hmm. there should be a substantially larger percentage right available. right correct okay yep. and we did we have done some second doses for those younger kids okay. so um so then we'll go to the next slide and look at clay county public health so the total Doses administered by Clay County Public Health, 18,981, and it was 189 at our last clinic. So if we flip to the next slide, we have a breakdown as of um, last week. We had two clinics. We had the clinic at MSUM that we invited the community to, and then we also had a clinic in the Family Service Center again. So total of 189 doses last week, so that was up. We had first doses of 17, second doses of 13, and then 146 of those were boosters. And then the pediatric breakdown is just first doses with the five to 11, four, and second doses, nine. So, and then we have a clinic, 
schedule for this week, so if we can slip, flip to the next slide there. So our clinic this week is in room eight of the uh, Family Service Center ITV room on Thursday the 20th from 10 to 2 for anyone age 12 and up, Pfizer and Moderna, and then from 3 to 5 for ages 5 and up. So anyone can come to that, um, that second afternoon clinic. And then Pfizer and um, we've got Pfizer and we also have, well, we just have Pfizer in the afternoon. And then there's a phone number on the slide there. If you need um, help or information, you can certainly call our hotline at 218-299-7204, or it's on the Clay County website. The clinics are listed there, and then the links to register. And then I also want to point out that we every clinic we have, we offer flu vaccines. So. Thank you. Let me talk about the testing data. If we go to this. Okay, so for the testing site, just the vault testing site um, through January 2nd, and that's what we have the data. So a total of 1,527 uh, tests were com completed that week, and then our positivity rate was at 25.81. So that's a huge jump in positivity um, for the testing site from the previous week. And then, yeah, you were going to talk about the yes. testing site. So I, I want to thank you all for the report. I, this data is very helpful as we continue to get as much information out to the community as possible um, in regards to positivity rates, testing, vaccine availability, hospital capacity. I have had a substantial amount of conversation with leaders within our county and specifically uh, the mayor of Moorhead. Shelly Carlson and I are really concerned at the decreased availability in hours at our testing site. Uh, I know Kathy and with collaboration with um, Desi Fleming across the river, you've really done a remarkable job at coordinating testing availability. And it's challenging when you have large employers who are trying to do their best to mitigate by having uh, folks test and um, I, I see the limited hours as problematic. Um, I know of several cases of people who were getting ready to leave the community for a weekend that had gone in on a, a Thursday and there were tests not available, both rapid and the other. Um, people coming back into our community on Saturdays basically to be turned away, or Sundays, excuse me. And I think this board needs to do more to encourage our um, leaders at the state to allow that testing site more hours. I'm not sure if it's a staffing issue. I know that there are colleges in this community where uh, students could, could work and gain some extra dollars. But um, if you look back at this testing information that you always provide us, and thank you for that, there were upwards of 5,000 tests processed in October, November, December of last year, which was at that point a spike. And I think that's important to mitigate to have that many tests. So um, the tests are available. The community is saying um, that this is something that's important. I think that it's um, strange <laughs> that um, our governor is encouraging increased testing availability, but limiting that availability. Um, <laughs> So I think that it's important that this board send a message begging uh, increased testing hours and days. Um, I think having 11 o'clock in the morning is problematic because if you have businesses that are working on developing mitigation strategies that include people testing before work, that doesn't make sense to have people leave um, and be at work until that. Um, so I would ask either Steve in collaboration with you if there's a letter that you have that you've, I know you've continually asked and been denied, um, <coughs> that we could write for this board to support. And um, the mayor of Moorhead is also wanting to um, send that in support as well. So we could, you know, I don't know if you wanna make a motion to do that, but I think that should happen sooner rather than later. I'd like to copy Representative Mark Wart, Representative Keeler and Senator Eakin on that as well. And I would like it to go to the governor's office as well as Minnesota Department of Health. Madam Chair, I would move that. Okay, we have a, a motion by Commissioner Campbell. Second. second. And a second by <laughs> Commissioner Everybody. Gross jumped in first. I think that it's important that obviously we're eager to help with that, I think that's <coughs> vitally important. Uh, 
Kathy, do you have anything? Yeah, Madam Chair, appreciate that. Um, I did have a conversation again on Friday um, with leadership of MDH, um, stressing the importance in um, talking about the uh, <laughs> problems we're having both with uh, um, the time frames um, and the fact that so many um, people from Moorhead are going over to the Fargo site, overwhelming their site. Um, I'm getting um, regular communication from the Fargo site, um, stating they just they can't keep up with all the Minnesota people they're getting over there, and I understand why. Their um, time frames are Monday through Friday, um, I believe eight to six or eight to five. Anyway, um, full days, and um, where the Moorhead site is not. So I think uh, people are trying to find wherever they can to get tested. So I push that again. I'm having a conversation with that leadership today, um, but a letter would be very helpful um, as well. And just one follow up and then I'll open it to the board. I think it's important that if we're hearing from public health and state leaders how important testing is to not respond to communities that are asking for it um, is causes people to question the importance of it. Not that it's right, but I think there are people in the community that say if this is so important, why aren't there increased availability? And I think it also shows good faith because Fargo did help, Cass County, North Dakota, did help test a lot of Minnesota residents as we have because we are a community that's in it together. And so I think it to not respond to increased cases or demand is not wise. Yeah, I just want to clarify my motion, and, my, and I, I would like my motion to, to have the letter go. If you're going to send a letter, send it to the top. And so I, I think the letter should be addressed to the governor. Mm -hmm. And uh, along with that, saying that on behalf of our, our public health department, we, we, need, we don't mm -hmm. want this. We need this. Mm -hmm. and, and then I do, I do think, and I don't know that that was in... Commissioner Mojo's original, in addition to who to copy it to, but I think that it should also be CC'd to the director of, of um, Department of, of Health and, and Safety. You know, yeah, my human recommendation services. was Malcolm's office is in addition to our representatives. Yeah. Very good. Uh, Commissioner Ebinger. This is an example, I think, and, and again, a reminder within the letter may be appropriate. We're a, we're a metropolitan area of a quarter million. We are the second largest metropolitan area in the state of Minnesota. And you listen to the briefings that they have coming out of the state. They're telling people in Hennepin and Ramsey, oh, we know you're crowded, so just go to some of the outer suburbs. And there's plenty of room for testing there. We don't have that option. And we are having to, to, to depend on the good graces of another state to provide uh, testing for our population. And we're wearing out our welcome. And it's time for the state of Minnesota to step up and realize we are not rocks and cows out here. This is a metropolitan area with the needs of a metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. And if they're not aware of it, we've got to make them aware of it. But it's very frustrating. It isn't just this instance, but there's a lot of times where it, it, there seems to be a real uh, tone deaf attitude coming from St. Paul on the needs of, of this community. And we need to state it clearly and let them know in no uncertain terms that we need more resources for this. And we can't depend on North Dakota to provide them to us. That's my rant. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Do you have any other comments? <clears throat> Did we vote on that? Well, we, could, we could throw in there too a little bit more about more testing kits available. Did we vote? Okay. No. Any further discussion? No. All those in favor of the motion to send a letter signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Carried. Thank you. And I'll uh, work with staff and coordinate with uh, Mayor Carlson's communication director and Carlson will get that sent soon. Any other discussion on the report? Yeah, Madam Chair, um, because of um, the numbers that are increasing significantly and we expect to see a lot more increase in the next few weeks. They anticipate it to be a real significant um, surge. Um, this would maybe be the time I know you voted, was it last week or the week before on a mask mandate? It might be a recommendation. At this time I'd be amiss not to recommend that. 
um, from an infectious disease um, mitigation strategy. And, and again, not for the whole county, but for our county employees, um, particularly with, we have mask, um, masking for the unvaccinated, but um, I know not popular, but masking, or yeah, masking for the vaccinated as well. So just uh, the board can make the decision, but the numbers are really increasing and we're, it's concerning. Madam Chair. Commissioner Campbell. I've, I've always said that we should follow the advice of, of you folks. And, and when you come out and say it, I will move that we go back into a mask mandate uh, until further notice. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Campbell and a second by Commissioner Keeley to implement a mask mandate. Open ended or uh, within, with, with, That would be within. Uh, going back to basically the, what we had last time, Correct. so, you know. Until when, we receive another recommendation. Pardon me? Until we receive another recommendation. Yes. Well, yeah, you know, until we can further look at data, but I, I guess I'm not suggesting that a county employee who is at their workstation needs to wear a mask. That wasn't the intent before either. So it would be to follow the same type of a masking policy that we had before. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Steve, have we created a masking policy? Uh, Madam Chair, we've had uh, one previously, but uh, we can uh, we can uh, polish that off and, and uh, work with Kathy and have, have that out again. Commissioner okay. Ebinger. As I recall, this applied to the public when they were in county buildings that we expect them to be masked. Yeah, Madam That'll Chair. That'll be contained in, in the policy. Yeah. And Commissioner Ebinger, we, there's plenty of mask availability, um, so we would definitely have those at the front of the buildings. Okay. Did that order from Gabe come in? I know he'd, he'd made an order contingent on us. Madam Chair, Commissioners, I believe that it did come in, yes. Uh, Darren, in regards to staff positivity rates, where are we at? I just did a quick um, calculation of the people that have submitted the form. This doesn't mean that it's, it's maybe missing people that haven't submitted the form. Um, but this year alone, since January, we've had 18 submitted, um, four that were not vaccinated, so a total of uh, 22. Since January 1st? Since January 1st, yeah. Most of them have been back or come back today. There's a few still out. Okay. But that's only the people that have reported. There may be more out there that we don't know about. Commissioner Campbell, effective when? How long does it take to get the signs up? Uh, we could probably have them up by uh, later this afternoon and make it effective. Did people bring masks today? Make it effective tomorrow. That would be my motion, make it effective. Uh, further discussion? I guess I would prefer it's effective this afternoon if possible. If we have people that are already at work and they didn't bring them. They... We do have them available in our buildings. Oh. What? My motion is tomorrow morning. Okay, that's fine. Okay. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, aye, carries. Thank you. All right, we'll coordinate on that letter. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask some other commissioner? Yes. Kaylee. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering about if we have any information about the federal kits that were promised um, where people could request, I believe it was four kits per household and what that's going to look like. We, I know we can request kits mailed to your home through vault and um, public health shared that out. So you could rest, request a kit and have that on hand at home. Um, and then those are proctored online and then you mail that in. Um, but in the news, there's been a promise for kits coming from the federal government as well. What do we know about that? I don't know that I have any more details than that other than um, I know the timeline was supposed to be later this week. Wednesday, I think was last I, I heard. Um, as we get more details, we'll definitely post that on our websites and Facebook, though. And then one more question. Um, as Jenny mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, there was um, 
a lot of folks in the community that reached out wondering about a mask mandate um, for Moorhead and countywide. I would say those that reached out to me were interested in um, if there was a way that Moorhead and Clay County could work together in coordination for a countywide mask mandate that the municipalities would support as well. But um, when I look at the data that we're given, I don't have a picture for what this is looking like, what the numbers are looking like in our surrounding communities. So it's hard to make a decision um, for Barnesville or, or Ulan when I don't know <laughs> what the pandemic is looking like in those areas. So I'm wondering if there's a way um, maybe by zip code or school district or, or something that we could get a better picture for what's happening in our rural communities. Yeah, it's, it's really challenging. We've attempted that in the past, and I think we talked about that too. It's extremely time consuming to be able to um, vet out um, particular um, communities, but we can rest assured that it's just widespread. It's, it's, um, it's continually, and as people move about and are doing all kinds of things, um, the, the important thing is, you know, as we see the numbers rise, you know, this will impact workforce and school officials. And um, as we met with the schools, they were already um, struggling with having enough staff to have their classrooms because of the number of people that were out. So I think it's widespread. It is widespread, we know. We just, I just think it's impossible. Um, it would be way too many hours that Becky doesn't have to try yeah. to, to figure out all the tiny communities, but we can rest assured it, it's all over the place, so. It's really widespread. So a little follow-up to that. Um, we have a testing site here in Moorhead, and obviously folks could drive in, um, make appointments and drive in from our surrounding areas. Are there any satellite testing opportunities in our rural community? Not to my knowledge. Just the um, we have some in the pharmacies locally, and then we do have quite a draw to this site as well. Uh, Fergus Falls was coming here, Becker County was coming here, Norman County, so there is quite a draw to that test site, which is, you know, that's where we shop and go for healthcare as well, so. Okay. Commissioner Campbell. And there, are, and there are testing opportunities in some of those places, whether they have pharmacies or whatever, and Local clinics pharmacy. or whatever in some of those communities, but uh, I, I guess I, when we come to a, a broader you know, just in terms of a discussion right now, and I appreciate the fact that, you know, it's brought up to talk about, but, but and this, this goes to Commissioner Ebbinger's comment a little while ago, we're a, we're a regional community of 250,000 people here, and to have a partial um, mandate in, in one particular area when the others don't do it, uh, you, you have to wonder, uh, you know, what, I, I think it's up to 60% of our population crosses the border every day to go to work. You know, and so if they're not doing it, how effective is it? You know, from from the standpoint of doing a, a one citywide one or one countywide one, you know, when the reality is, is sixty percent of our population, working population. Let, let me rephrase that: of our working population, works across the border on a daily basis. And. So that's just food for thought. So. Commissioner Ebinger. Yeah, and just from, a, from a, a basic pragmatic approach to this, this has become a highly contentious issue. And if you mandate it, you've got to enforce it. Or it is, is simply going through the motions. And I don't know if enforcement is, is possible, frankly. Uh, community-wide we can within our own facilities we can tell people to leave if they don't abide by by our our protocols but to do it community-wide you're gonna have businesses that resist it and don't you can't put it on the businesses to enforce it uh, law enforcement in this community is spread so thin they're lucky to make the calls that come in on on a 911 issue uh, I, I just, I don't know the efficacy of going through a motion or, or the legislation, the process of coming up with an ordinance and then expecting the police to enforce it or businesses to enforce it. It's just, 
uh, on, a, on a practical basis, it's a can of worms. Mm -hmm. And if you can't be effective, I don't know if it's, if it's something you wanna, you wanna open up. I think that is important. I, you know, I appreciate that citizens reach out, but uh, to preface having five Moorhead residents asking for a mask mandate for Moorhead, I don't think constitutes um, having the other smaller cities within the community. I've certainly not heard from any other city leadership asking for um, much the same. I think that having served on the board last year, part of my struggle was having mandates from St. Paul <clears throat> mandated in Clay County when it was hard to know what, what the issue was on the ground. Um, and so I appreciate that it, it should be more of a local approach. I do really struggle and will continue to say that I struggle with the enforcement piece of even having a, a Clay County facility um, mandate, and, and that is what it is, but um, you know, I think having a, a strong policy <laughs> to determine when and if and how these should be implemented, I think will help us going forward. But certainly, I think the this board understands the major need to communicate vaccine availability, testing availability, and, and I think that's our best effort. Any further? I can just, one more thing. Commissioner uh, Campbell. Commissioner Marshall, I, I, just to follow up, but one, one thing in terms of, of why I made the motion on the county facility one, obviously the, the one priority to me was when I get a recommendation from public health, it, it's, it's, it's pretty significant. And um, I'm confident, based on what we know, the vast majority, I think, of our county employees are already vaccinated. I think that some of the numbers that we have show that. Um, but what we, what we never know of is the public coming in to visit with our staff. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the more concerning thing for me, is that we, we don't have that. And with this, um, even though it might not be as severe, Omicron, you hear it's not quite as severe, but it is still spreading. Mm -hmm. And um, and hopefully we can get it. But that's that's kind of just going back to my issue. I'm, I'm kind of concerned about um, the public coming in mm -hmm. uh, into our facilities. And that we can deal with. Just to recap, our community, as opposed, compared to these numbers, has seen a 1,396 increase in COVID cases over the last week. Uh, I don't think you could answer this, but um, if Sanford and Essentia aren't viewing this as an emergency to set up a field hospital, I'm curious uh, what, what numbers they would justify something like that. And so I think part of me... Um, continuing to evaluate how we mitigate is what our hospital capacity is. And um, if they're not threatened by a surge of 1,300, um, I'm wondering what they would be. But not that you can answer it. But. Yeah. Um, Madam Chair, I know that, um, and Becky's mentioned this before, that the hospitalization is a lagging uh, indicator. So we may see increases, but um, they're certainly vigilant in um, their planning with their. Um, emergency management teams internally. We just don't, we aren't privy to that information gotcha. as of yet. Gotcha. Any other discussion? If not, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.